All right. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Today, we're going to talk about um, neural networks. So, obviously, um, I think that's you know, if you were to take a machine learning course, you would you get um, a lot sort of farther into talking about this sorts of material. But actually, um, the other thing that I would say is uh, a lot of what we've already done um, and and covered in terms of approaches uh, and and models are things that kind of build up to this and that they would um, that you would learn about in in those sorts of courses uh, anyways and so um, in terms of machine learning material um, you guys are probably farther along um, than, than you might expect and, and even today we'll see a lot of um, analogies with with stuff that that we've already covered. Um, and, you know, machine learning has its own set of, of lingo, a lot of which we'll, we'll talk about today. Um, but you'll find uh, it's, it's just sort of similar to um, a lot of the concepts that, that we've already covered. So let's go ahead and, and start off. So moving beyond splines and kernels. So both of these are sort of extensions beyond um, linearity for functional form, right? We gave that example of that weird sine cosine um, wave thing where we're able to uh, fit these really neat um, uh, predictions um, via very different methods, so splines and kernels, right? So this is a, you know, semi-parametric approach that is functionally flexible, whereas your kernels are powerful non-parametric approach for finding decision boundaries or, um, or fitting um, very non-linear or I mean you could you could do it for linear too it wouldn't be as efficient but uh, generally for fitting nonlinear curves. Um, so what we'll talk about today, um, neural networks, which I will abbreviate throughout the rest of the notes as NN, um, is the next logical step. And what we'll find is that it's similar in principle to many approaches we have learned. Um, but in practice, um, it can be a powerful tool to handle scaling. Um, okay, so when we, I guess when you think about machine learning, today, um, 
like splines and kernels. I mean, these are things that might get taught um, in a more um, introductory manner, but oftentimes gets, gets skimmed over. Um, but it's doing similar types of things in principle to what a lot of the more classical machine learning approaches like neural networks are doing. And so you might ask yourself, like, why, why is um, like neural networks and, and um, other forms of, of deep learning and reinforced learning so popular these days? Um, and, and that has to do with the application in practice. Um, so in terms of scaling, um, uh, it handles more features. So these, uh, so features uh, is kind of the lingo for explanatory variables. I have no idea why everyone calls it different things. Um, in, in, um, in, in the econ world, we call them independent variables. In the statistics world, they're called explanatory variables. In the machine learning world, they're called features. They're all the same thing. Um, and then the other nice thing um, is that you can handle uh, more data. So larger n, aka more rows. Um, and so in practice, these sorts of things are um, pretty nice because you tend to run up against computational complexity constraints when you're doing things like uh, kernel regressions, especially as you move to higher dimensions, or in other words, when you have more and more uh, variables. Um, Okay, so there is, um, I'm gonna try and introduce some of the machine learning lingo for folks who are interested in taking, you know, machine learning classes in the future. At least you, this will get you somewhat familiar and we'll see how it's analogous to um, a lot of the, the stuff that we've, we've already talked about. So machine learning terms. Um, and I'm just going to make a list of these, and then we'll sort of cover them as we move through the, the actual material. So we've got tensors, layers, weights, uh, loss function, or loss score, um, optimizer, and uh, perceptron. Okay, so there are these six things, all of which we've actually already talked about um, in, in different ways throughout um, this course. So as I work through our um, examples, I will uh, try and hit all of these so that we, we know uh, what we're talking about. Um, so the first thing is let's build up a neural network um, and we'll sort of base it on the foundation of, of what we already know. So let's look at a neural network that replicates linear regression. So you may see something like this. This is um, a representation of a network diagram where you have 
two features or two explanatory variables leading to a particular type of outcome. Um, so may look something like this. Um, okay. So you may look at this equation and notice it's pretty similar to um, stuff that we've looked at before, right? And so this is the same as something like this. Okay, and so you might imagine that your eyes are the same thing as your variable inputs and your weights are the same as your coefficients and your output is basically um, the same as your, your y. Um, so in terms of the nomenclature, um, we consider sort of each of these things as a layer. So this is your input layer and this is your output layer. And we're gonna add more onto these later. Um, the weights here, are weights that you multiply against your um, inputs that will calibrate them to, uh, to be equivalent to some kind of output that you're interested in. Uh, so already we are sort of covering some of these terms here, right? So your layers, your weights, um, so a perceptron is actually just a node, um, a node in the model. So each of the circles represents a node. Um, I think generally uh, we refer to intermediate layer, intermediate nodes between the input layer and the output layer uh, as perceptrons, but I think technically any of the nodes can be considered a, a perceptron. Um, okay, um, one of the other terms is uh, tensors. So tensors um, are the data structure um, of each node. Uh, it's pretty simple. Um, so scalars are zero dimensional tensors. Um, a vector is a one dimensional tensor. Um, a two by two matrix is a 2D tensor. Um, and then the arrays that we use in R um, is a multi-dimensional tensor. Um, so tensors are basically just like vectors and matrices um, or some kind of array. Okay, so the difference in these types of models. Um, so let's, let's talk about why we distinguish this. Um, let, me, let me go back actually. Uh, why is it that we distinguish 
um, these weights uh, from, from this linear equation. Um, and, and the reason is that the weights can actually be done in different approaches and that we solve for these coefficients in a different approach. So let's take a look at that. So solving for betas versus Ws. So in a linear regression, we have something like a equation here. So we we've, we've briefly mentioned this um, a few times throughout the class. And if you've taken a uh, any sort of regression um, class, you've probably covered something like this. Um, and this is a closed form analytical solution. So closed form uh, analytical solution. So this guarantees correct um, solution and it is fast in theory. Um, okay, and so because the linear regression is so common um, and it's been worked on for a long time. Uh, when you think about what the linear regression is doing, right, it is trying to figure out betas such that it minimizes the, um, the sum of the squared error terms. Um, so in, in that optimization approach, um, it turns out if you manipulate the data in, in, in this way, that you get the solution for your betas. Um, but you, you don't have to do it that way, right? You could run it in a traditional sort of optimization um, and solve for it numerically. And so that's how weights are done. So weights are solved numerically. Um, so commonly through, um, optimizers, uh, such as gradient descent. And so we're not going to talk about, um, specific optimizer algorithms, um, but things like gradient descent are, are fairly common uh, and, and in fact gradient descent is is one of the ones that that's employed um, is one of the most widely employed algorithms to to solve for weights despite um, it's it's fairly simple um, uh, methodology and so what are the some of the benefits of doing it this way um, not nearly as memory intense as analytical. Um, and so every, everything that you've done to this point for linear regression has been uh, solved using um, the closed form analytical solution method, but what you'll find is that if you are working with, for example, millions and millions of data points, um, that it's gonna get harder and harder to do the approach on the left. Um, when you have to do the inverse of a super large matrix, it is extremely memory intensive. And so it could be really fast, but, um, but it could be like too computationally large for your computer to do. Um, 
And one of the nice things about solving it numerically is that um, it scales very efficiently, which means that, yeah, it might be slower technically than doing a um, closed form solution, uh, but actually with how computing has improved so much over the last couple decades, the speed difference tends to be less and less noticeable, but the scaling tends to be um, a lot better. And then importantly, um, can be applied flexibly for any functional form. So the problem with the closed form solution for betas is that it only applies for a linear regression. Whereas we're, we're about to go back to that example of the network that I drew and start to add layer in complexity to it. And in any way that we do that, you are still able to do a numerical solver because it's generic. Um, and so I can do crazy, crazy transformations of my functional form um, and still solve for my coefficients. Um, and you would not be able to do that with a um, linear regression approach. Um, I, okay, but there is one drawback, or, or there, I mean, there, there are lots of trade-offs, but one of the larger drawbacks of doing this wait, uh, waiting and, and optimizing through um, a numerical solver is that these uh, are not, um, these are not always uh, convex functions. Um, and they could be very, uh, very nonlinear. And so your objective function, um, your objective function uh, is not guaranteed to be um, optimal. And so you don't, so what that means is you don't always have the uh, correct solution. Uh, and in that case, you may need to do some, some iterations, although a lot of the solvers these days will kind of handle that for you. But you should know that, where the, whereas the betas are always guaranteed to be, uh, guaranteed to be correct, your, your weights and your Ws are not. Okay. So I wanna draw a quick, a diagram um, for the operational aspect of the um, neural network before we get into more um, example details. So this will be kind of a generic version of the example I was showing before. So you have your input, it's going into a layer, and we'll, we'll see this in a second, but you'll have some kind of transformation, uh, and that may, that may happen several times. Um, we also need to know the weights associated with this. Um, and you may have another layer with another transformation and a different set of weights. Um, and then this will ultimately give you some predictions, right? And so we sort of call this Y hat. Um, and you also have your true set of values, Y. Um, So you may have what's called a loss function here that goes um, to a loss score. This is all 
fairly um, normal nomenclature in machine learning. Um, and the loss score goes into the optimizer, which is then used to calibrate your weights. Um, and this sort of stuff um, is actually very closely related to things that we've already looked at. So the loss function is basically your error. So y minus uh, y hat, something like that. Uh, in, in some form, right? And so we've, we've discussed this concept quite a bit. Um, the loss score might be something like your mean squared error, a uh, conglomeration of the, um, of the loss function into a single sort of score. So the, so the MSE is, is a very common loss score, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about some, some other ones that you could look at. And essentially what's happening is, um, uh, if we think about this in the context of a linear regression, you are getting your coefficients and your inputs um, into a single layer, and that's giving out your uh, predictions. We can do other sorts of transformations to make it not linear, right? But the general principle behind the neural network is gonna stay the same and, and sort of look like this. Okay, so if we jump back to this discussion, so now we've talked about all of these things, right? Um, so we know what a tensor is, we know what our layers are, and weights, loss function, optimizer, and perceptron. I guess I should also add um, features as another one common one that we use. Um, okay, so we're gonna now talk about, um, let's see. So if, if we're, hopefully everyone is, is pretty comfortable with most of this diagram and, and we'll, we'll now focus on this sort of layer transformation. Um, so when we look at this example, um, that's all well and good, uh, but it's restrictive for um, linearity, right? So similar type of thing that, that we've done before. Uh, and so how do we sort of depart from that? Let's consider a function, um, so same type of thing here. But now we're gonna treat this slightly differently. So the main difference here is we have something, we have this A. So this is known as an activation function. Uh, and this allows for a non-linear transformation of the inputs at each node. Okay, so what is what is going on here? If I have some kind of linear combination of my inputs, um, maybe I want that to translate to a nonlinear output. And so you can have this activation function to help sort of mediate that. Um, and so let's talk about um, 
common activation functions. Uh, one is the identity slash linear. So this is essentially where you don't have any transformation, right? And so what happens here is you have um, something that looks like this. Uh, so whatever my X's are, it's just going to be some kind of line, right? And so there's uh, no, there, this really is kind of uh, having no activation function. Um, so what other ones can we do? Let me, let me just jump to a new, new page. There is a, activation um, function called the step function or the step or, or the binary step function. Uh, and this is where you have um, f of x is equal to, oh, that was a terrible brace, uh, zero for x is less than zero and one for x is greater than or equal to one. So that might look something like, so that'll look something like this. Um, we've got a logistic activation function, which hopefully you guys are somewhat more familiar with. That might look something like this, one over one plus e to the negative x. Um, oops, that's a, so this is 0 0.510. Um, another common one is the 10H. This looks something like this. Uh, and then one last one that I'll introduce is the rectified linear unit, also known as ReLU. Uh, and this is something like this, zero, four, x is less than or equal to zero, x for x is greater than zero. Okay. Um, and so basically, just to clarify again, these activation functions are basically like, you know, if my outcome that I'm interested in is um, like a 
uh, binary variable. So if it's like male or female or something, or, or categorical, you could choose something like a, uh, a step variable or a logistic, um, or sorry, a step activation function or a logistic activation function to make sure that your outcomes are transformed from your inputs into the, into the proper um, Ys. And so in here, this activation function is now allowing you to transform your uh, X's into um, whatever sort of uh, outcome that, uh, of the form that you're interested in. Um, and so this really is kind of step by step doing the same sorts of things that we have uh, discussed throughout this course, right? Because we are um, trying to create new functional forms that, that best fit the structure, the underlying structure of your, um, uh, of your data and of the outcome that you're, you're interested in. And so the choice of the activation function can be a pretty important um, important nuance in in terms of getting what you want out of this um, this network. Okay. And so now, hopefully, you guys have have seen how we've um, constructed this network to create a linear regression. And then we've modified it to now be able to essentially have uh, any sort of nonlinear function, um, a functional form that, that we want to apply to the data. And now we're going to take a look at um, the sort of next step here to develop uh, a neural network. And so this is. Um, one of the mo most basic types of neural networks. It's called a feed-forward neural network. Uh, and this is also sometimes referred to as a multi-layer perceptron. Um, Okay, so now let's take a look at layering in some additional complexity here. So what we have going on here is essentially, uh, or, or what I've drawn so far for I1, I2 going to L1 is basically exactly the same as what we've done before, um, where you have some kind of outcome um, with some activation function on your weights times your, oops, not W, sorry. your weights times your input layer. Okay. Except now we're going to do that um, a couple times. Um, and this is 
W want and this will be something like L2 is equal to A12 Like so, and we'll do it one more time. So this is W31 and W32. Okay. So what the heck is going on here? We've got different weights uh, and um, activation functions. Uh, well, oftentimes the activation functions are all going to be the um, same form. So you would choose something like a, you know, like a logistic activation function, and that would get applied across all these. But the weights would all be different. Um, and these would all converge to your P. So this uh, would be V1, V2, V3, and your P would be equal to activation function times, uh, or of V1 times L1 plus V2, L2 plus V3, L3. Um, okay, so what's happening here? You are essentially introducing more parameters, more degrees of freedom on which to calibrate your model. Um, and essentially, by doing this, you are able to now flexibly take on a, um, a highly nonlinear function, right? And so the activation function lets us go to um, a particular type of output, but by layering more and more parameters um, into here, you are, um, you are essentially making the functional form of the data transformation super, super flexible. Um, and so it's almost as though, um, it's almost as though you would be doing something like uh, y equals, you know, beta one x one plus beta two x one, right? Um, without but but you're transforming it in such a way that you are able to take advantage of of having sort of multiple coefficients. Um, and so this this thing here is a different layer um, in between your input and output layers, uh, and we call this a hidden layer. So this is one hidden layer, which is sort of one set of transformations away. Um, you could actually have more than one hidden layer, and we'll, we'll talk about that in, in, in a moment. Um, but hopefully you guys can see the idea here. Um, by allowing it to calibrate um, to not just two um, parameters, but actually, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, you allow for a whole, a great deal more complexity. Um, and so you can choose actually how many layers that you, uh, that you have, and you can choose how many nodes in each layer that you want to do.
right? And as, as you can imagine, as I increase the degrees of freedom, um, the closer my line is gonna be to um, any particular point um, because it's essentially like adding, it, it's the same as adding more parameters in your uh, linear regression. Um, and so if I have a lot more layers and a lot more um, nodes, then you could end up with uh, overfitting issues. Um, all right, so, so this is gonna revisit the same sort of idea about how to choose the, the right number of um, layers and, and nodes and um, avoiding uh, the two sides of the issue of, of bias and, and variance or, or of uh, bias and, and overfitting. Um, So how many hidden layers? Um, and how many nodes or perceptrons to choose? Um, OK. So in the feed forward neural network um, there are a couple sort of rules of thumb uh, so let's talk about number of hidden layers um, if you have zero then you are representing linearly separable functions. Um, so this is basically like a linear regression, right? Where you can break out the, um, the data into your different X's um, and combine them linearly to get your, your answer. Um, so one will approximate any continuous mapping in finite space. And then two plus will represent arbitrary decision boundaries to arbitrary accuracy. With correct activation function. Um, so it's typically pretty rare to have more than two hidden layers. You're usually kind of good to go with one for um, continuous variables and maybe two for uh, more um, for discrete or combinations of discrete and, and continuous. Although I, I, I will say uh, it's it's going to be context dependent on, on the data and, and the features themselves. Um, so number of nodes or perceptrons. Um, and so here again, I'll provide rules of thumb. Uh, Apparently still not um, hugely agreed upon. Um, so the num so there's one equation that I've seen thrown around. So the number of nodes um, in your hidden layer H is equal to 
Um, and samples divided by alpha times the number of input nodes and number of output nodes um, and alpha is a sort of scalar that people set between say two to ten um, I've also seen um, size of input layer. Um, so an input is greater than an H is greater than an output, something like this. Uh, I've also seen an H approximately equal to two thirds. Um, an input plus an output. And I've also seen an H less than two times an input. Um, so there's a bunch of different rules of thumbs going on here. Um, again, I don't think that anyone um, has necessarily come to uh, a, a great sort of agreement on number of, of nodes. Um, but actually, I think that if we think about this in a sort of sensical, logical approach, you could always um, try and maximize your um, predictive ability, right? And so uh, I think one, one, so one way of doing this, if you wanted to move beyond the rule of thumb, is to do cross-validation, choose your number of nodes based off of how well it predicts out of sample. Um, so sort of going back to um, the same sort of approach that we've um, talked about before. Um, okay, we are almost to 11. So why don't we take a quick five minute break here before we jump into um, showing the example. Um, of, of how to do this uh, in, in R. Uh, and in the meantime, um, yeah, I can, I can take questions. So let's come back in five minutes at uh, 11.04.
Okay, let's continue on. Um, so we'll take a, a, a look at uh, how to implement um, this particular type of neural network, um, the feed forward neural network in R. And we're going to look uh, again at one of the ISLR data sets. So let me load this in real quickly. Um, okay, so we're going to look at a set of data from ISLR called default. Um, and so if I click on this data, we should be able to see um, this is an indicator variable of no or yes for whether or not um, the person has defaulted on a loan. Uh, and then there's some information about them. So uh, whether or not they're a student, um, their, their average balance um, on their credit cards, um, and then their annual income. So from this, we're gonna see, um, we're gonna try and predict uh, whether or not um, they are default. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the, uh, the variables from yes or no to ones and zeros. Um, and then I'm going to create a new, um, new set of variables, or sorry, new, new data table. Uh, and this is similar to what we did last time where I want to scale everything, um, which can be uh, important to do for um, this type of neural network. Uh, and then I'm gonna create a uh, training set and testing set. Um, this is a slightly different way of doing it uh, where I am basically grabbing 70% of, um, of my default data set and using that as my training and then and you just do the negative of, of that. These are the, the rows that I want to return. Um, so you're sampling, you're sampling these, these rows. Um, and so if I, if I run these guys here, uh, I will have split. So from my default scaled, so if we take a quick look at that, now the uh, student balance and income are um, not, uh, that they're all sort of scaled to be um, at the uh, scaled to this to the same uh, degree, um, and then we have out of those ten thousand uh, rows, uh, there's three thousand that are randomly selected as my test, and seven thousand that are randomly selected um, as def um, as a tra uh, training. Okay, so we're going to use a package called NeuralNet. Uh, oop, I have not installed it on this computer. So one moment. And while that's installing, uh, I'll show how to run this model. So the function is called NeuralNet. Um, and pretty similar um, as with the uh, other regression function models that we've done. So my outcome of interest and my input, um, the data that I'm gonna train it on is from default train. Uh, and then there's gonna be a couple of 
couple additional inputs. So hidden, as you can probably imagine, stands for hidden layer. Um, and here you can put information about how many nodes that you want in each layer. So here I'm gonna have two hidden layers, uh, one of which will have two perceptrons or two nodes, and then the second hidden layer will have three uh, perceptrons or nodes. Um, our activation function is going to be logistic, and then we are not going to have a linear output. So, oh, I need to load in neural net. Okay. So now it's going to run and train um, uh, across these um, 10,000 points. Um, and here is where, um, this is where some of the computational complexity starts to uh, creep in into place and, and why, you know, machine learning has really taken off in the, in the last couple of years. Um, I haven't enabled any, uh, the, the way that a lot of these run um, on, on the computer are actually a lot more efficient to run through um, actually graphics processor um, processing units because uh, these, these sorts of things can be run in, in parallel. Um, but I haven't enabled any of those, those settings. And so it's a little bit slower. You, you see that um, this, this probably took longer than any of the, um, any of the models that um, we've, we've run. But like I said, with, with the trade-off with um, this, this type of uh, calibration of, of the coefficients is that I can scale this to really, really large um, data sets where you wouldn't necessarily be able to feasibly do that um, with some of the uh, approaches that, that we've done before. Um, okay, so let's take a look. Actually, I'm not even sure I've, I haven't um, used summary with this before. Uh, but yes, okay, it will tell you um, something about um, the, the model uh, and, and you can look at all, all of these. Uh, it'll give you like the weights, for example. Um, Let's take a look at the plot and see what this looks like. Um, okay. So what we have here is our input layer on the left, our output layer, and then as I specified in my neural network, um, I have, I've chosen two layers, um, two hidden layers, because I'm working in a categorical space. It probably would do fine actually with just one hidden layer, but I sort of just wanted to, to demonstrate. Uh, and in the first layer, you have two nodes, and in the second layer, you have three nodes. Um, and so it looks something like this. So here we can see the weights for each of these nodes, uh, and then the weights uh, coming out of those outcomes. Um, and then these, I believe, are parameters associated with the, um, with the activation function. Um, but I'm, not, I'm actually not entirely sure what the, what the blue ones are. Um, this steps uh, tells you how many iterations of the gradient descent um, it took before arriving at this particular solution. Uh, yeah, and so this, um, this set of results is going back to sort of the philosophy I've, I've sort of been um, 
hinting at throughout this course about prediction versus inference. It's not as though you could really interpret any meaning for any particular um, weight because you've done uh, a whole set of sort of transformations and really it cares about the combination of weights across your different linear combination functions. Um, so with respect to any particular input, it's really not going to tell you anything. Um, but what it, what, is, what it is able to do is to give you um, predictions from your now sort of calibrated model. So let's go ahead and, and take a look at that. Um, so I could grab the predictions. Uh, so instead of using the predict function, it uses what's known as the compute function. Uh, and so similar to predict, you give it the model and then uh, you give it um, new data. If you don't give it any new data, it's just going to predict um, the uh, in sample outcomes of your Y's. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do now is from my predictions, um, I'm going to go back into uh, my test um, and look at um, the probabilities, right, which are what, which are the outcome of your activation function, which we chose as logistic. Um, and then I'm going to assign it a value, um, a prediction value, which is basically saying if the prediction, if the probability uh, is greater than 0.5, then it's going to be one. Otherwise, it's going to be zero. So if the model says that they'll default with a probability higher than 0.5, then we'll just get, say that they defaulted. And if not, then we'll say that, that they didn't default. Okay. Uh, and now I could do something like calculate the, um, the overall error, um, error rate. Uh, and so how would I do that? I would do Actually, I'm trying to remember how to do absolute value. Uh, yes, that's right. So this would be the absolute value between um, my default, which is my true y, uh, minus the predicted one. So this is y minus y hat. I'm doing the absolute value of that uh, divided by the total number uh, of rows. Oops, I need to sum this. OK, so we have a 2.5% error rate. So out of, out of these um, 3,000 testing ones, uh, let's see, it's this times 3,000. So out of 3,000, my neural network is able to correctly identify, you know, 2,924. Um, it's got 76 of them are, are wrong. So pretty good. Um, and you could 
go back and see how a neural network would compare against, you know, a traditional logistic regression or an LDA or, um, or the KNN, right? Uh, and then so these are all approaches that we've done. And the nice thing about the neural net is that it doesn't need to just be confined to classifier problems. It can also do um, regular um, continuous uh, problems. Um, the other, yeah, so, so um, I, I should say that this is, this is the first time that I'm teaching um, neural networks and so I'm, I'm kind of uh, forgetting to, to mention a, a, a few things. One of the, one of the big benefits of um, the neural networks is that whereas we, we put a lot of work into regularization, right, choosing which uh, features or explanatory variables to include, we sort of we sort of built that uh, up throughout um, our approach uh, with you know stepwise uh, stepwise forward and backwards regression, and then with uh, you know lasso and ridge, uh, and then even extracting um, something like the principal components. This is much more in line with with the latter couple ones because you can include basically all the features and let the weighting decide which ones are sort of the most important. Um, and um, may I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I know you calculated this like error term from the like the overall error rate, and then on the plot of this neural network, there's also this like error at the bottom. Are they like synonymous to each other? uh yeah sort of um that error is gonna be the average error uh let me see I, I i should make sure um it should be the the average error for the in sample um and so it's gonna be usually gonna be um it's it's usually gonna be the error the, or that the, usually that error is gonna be larger than than this error um yeah let me see sometimes uh i'm not so so this error term, sometimes I'm not completely sure uh, what they spit out in the default value. So I, I kind of prefer to calculate the error myself. Um, mm. This is, you know, this is this one is probably the mean squared error, which um, which actually is going to be equivalent to your um, uh, or this this might be the this might be the um, loss score. Yeah, which which is going to be equivalent to to that error, and then they take the average across um, a bunch of the runs. Uh, but generally, you don't want to do mean squared error for like uh, classification types of problems because uh, it quality qualitatively doesn't make as much sense, um, it, but usually ends up being the same as, as your, your error rate. Okay, um, thank you. Yep. Uh, I, I should mention, and, and this is actually because I was having a conversation with some um, of the students on, on the project this morning, that there are other sorts of error rates um, that you could measure and that you could actually calibrate this sort of um, model on. Um, so for example, I could look at the false negative rate, um, which is, I always forget, does, any, does anyone know, is this type one or type two error? Um, help me out here. And you could also do a false positive rate. Uh, 
Wait, let me just look this up really quick. Type one error. Um, type one is false positive and type two is false negative. Yeah. Um, okay, so what does that mean? Um, so let's see. There, there are two types of errors that are happening here. Um, there is an error where someone who, uh, who defaults, but, um, but you predict that they don't default. That's one type of error. Uh, and then there is a person who doesn't default, but you predict does default. So you could imagine that if you are a lender, you care a lot more about one of these rates than the other, right? Um, if you wanna be conservative, let's say you just wanna avoid giving uh, credit to people who you think is gonna default even if they don't actually default and you care much more about getting it right that they, um, you, you care a lot more um, about the error rate associated with um, people who would default and that you think don't default, right? And this this could be this this could be similar for um, uh, I, for like the medical field if you're doing like diagnostics for like cancer or um, or even I don't know coronavirus, right? You, you care a lot more about uh, false negatives than false positives because, uh, you know, false positives are, are, are bad, right? Which is, you know, I tell someone that they have cancer, but they don't actually have cancer. Um, and you could go through a whole series of more diagnostic tests and maybe it's more expensive, but at the end of the day, the misdiagnosis is, um, is more of like a monetary issue. Whereas if you were to misdiagnose someone that did have cancer and they didn't, uh, um, or you, you would say that someone who did have cancer and you, and you misdiagnose them and you say that they don't have cancer, that's potentially like a lethal mistake, right? And so, you may actually want to calibrate your model to be more accurate on false negatives or on false positives than on the overall error rate. And if you were to do that, so if, for example, in any of the ways, in any of any of the approaches that we've done before, with a uh, where we're you know calibrating like the lambda on a lasso ridge instead of using the mean squared error as your metric, you could actually calibrate to a false negative rate or false ne positive rate as your metric, as your standard. And what ends up happening is that you would lower your false negative rate, even if it increases your overall rate. Um, so maybe you get a lot more false positives, but you get less false negatives. So that's, that's something that 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 can be considered depending on the context of, of your problem as well. And so let's let's take a quick look at how we can calculate a false negative rate. Um, so this is um, in the case where your true uh, oops from the test. If your true default rate is predicted to be larger than, uh, or is larger than what you are saying. That's basically saying that the true one is where someone actually defaulted and you thought that they didn't default. And so you got a false negative. Um, then I'm going to add up all the ones um, where that happened. And now I'm actually gonna divide by not 
all of the data, but only the data in which default, um, where they actually did default. Um, and so if our overall error rate is 2.5%, we could go in and, and figure out the false negative rate. Um, and you can actually see that the false negative rate is actually quite high. Um, and so if I were to take a quick look at the raw data, uh, oops. Um, you could, you can see that the number of defaults is really quite low. Um, in fact, only 3% of people are defaulting. And so if I were to just, if I were simply to predict that nobody um, that no one defaulted at all, then my error rate would only be 3.3%. So then suddenly my, um, my 2.5% error rate doesn't look so good because it's, it's almost, it's just slightly better than sort of guessing, right? The false positive rate is probably a lot better. Um, so let's see, I could do the same thing, but now I flip these, right? This is saying you guess that someone who didn't default did default. And then this, the denominator is just so much bigger because so few people defaulted in our data set. So let's take a look. Right, and here the error is like 0.3%. Um, and so if I were to uh, calibrate my weights to minimize this value instead of this value, um, then your overall error rate may increase quite a bit, but you could drop your false negative rate, you know, if that's what you care about, by a, a much greater extent. Um, and so I think that this type of thing is something that you should be thinking about for outcomes where, um, where, partic where the number of uh, outcomes for a particular category is especially small. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll typically notice that the overall error rate is, is really small, but that your type two or your type one error could be really large. Um, yeah, and, and you can do a trade-off there uh, where you can vastly improve your false negative rate without increasing your overall error rate by, by a huge amount. Um, okay. So that kind of concludes um, our introduction here. Uh, not too many questions there. Okay, actually I see one question popping up. Uh, how, how do we decide on the appropriate number of hidden layers? Um, so the number of hidden layers, as I was sort of mentioning before, um, it's pretty, uh, there isn't really a, a great set, uh, agreed upon way. Um, typically you're gonna have one to two hidden layers, probably no more than three. Uh, you're usually not gonna get much of an improvement. And some of the like literature and resources that I've looked at describe uh, 
uh, that you can have like one hidden layer for purely continuous functions and two hidden layers for, you know, functions that may be sort of discontinuous. Um, but again, it context, it's really dependent on, on context uh, of your features and size of the problem and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then in ter terms of, okay, I see, um, how to interpret the results compared to a regression where we have betas. So again, to reemphasize this type of approach is not for inference, it is for prediction. And so these weights, uh, yeah, good luck interpreting them. They don't, they don't, again, they don't really mean anything. There are these weird weights that are associated with this post transformation uh, and then sort of across multiple um, sort of combinations of, uh, of your of your nodes through these um, hidden layers. It, it really there is no interpretation of a, of a weight that you would be extracting from the neural network. You are primarily concerned with the ability of this model to do prediction, and if you I think it would be a very neat exercise, and, and maybe this is something that I would do for, for future classes, is I could, I could take this particular model and I could compare it against, you know, a logistic regression or an LDA, and I'm, I'm willing to bet that, that the, the prediction accuracy of, of this type of model is, is going to be uh, quite a bit higher than in your regular regression models because it's so functional with its uh, ability to take on um, um, a different sort of functional forms. Uh, and, and sort of that having been said, you do have to be careful about overfitting because with, with so many parameters, um, you could run into that issue. So if it's well calibrated, right, against, um, against uh, like a testing set, um, yeah, I think this would this would do very well. Um, and then, how do we decide which variables are important to the dependent variable? So, same sort of thing. Um, I think I think you could actually get some sense of that, although typically uh, that's not information that you would extract from from this. It's it's mainly with the with the prediction. Um, so you don't care so much about individual. Uh, um, okay, some some other questions that are that are coming in between other classification methods that were learned in class. How does neural network stand out? Um, yeah. Oh, okay. So he's saying that that I answered it. So so at a at a at a higher level. Uh, Again, the neural networks, like, like all of these things are um, context dependent on, on the problem and, and there are different ways you can approach these problems. The neural network is flexible, right? Because we can take many different functional forms and so you could actually run through a bunch of different activation functions that give you similar outputs. I could, I could look at a, you know, the, the stepwise function for this because that would also give you know, this binary outcome of default versus not default. Um, so I could quickly do that in here, right? Um, which which is a nice sort of feature um, of of a neural network. Um, and then the other thing is that the scaling is is really different. So when we talk about this in in theory, right? You are regressing like against a logistic function or with the LDA functional form with the uh, Gaussian uh, assumption. Um, and, and those will solve for the coefficients in one particular way. The way that this does it is it's very efficient for large, large data sets. Um, and so that's kind of the application with big data uh, is that it's easier to, um, or it makes more sense to apply this type of approach compared to a lot of the classical approaches that, that we've covered um, with, with uh, linear regression. And, and in fact, uh, I would not recommend that you actually run a, like even if you were doing something as simple as a linear regression, if you are doing a regression against millions, uh, tens of millions of, of data points, 
uh, I would not suggest that you run that in a traditional linear regression function that solves it analytically. You're going to find that your computer is going to run out of memory very quickly and it's going to crash. Um, because to do the inverse matrix of the X, XTX inverse, that is, a, that is a very memory intensive process. Whereas here you are doing a trade-off with the computational speed, but its ability to scale really largely. And in fact, at a certain point, it becomes more, it actually becomes more efficient and faster to do gradient descent numerically than to solve it analytically. Um, yes, okay. So, any other questions? Um, and and if not, you know, we'll we'll end here today. We'll end a little bit earlier since we weren't uh, intending to have this lecture anyways. Um, next lecture, I may try and cover uh, decision trees, and um, if we have time, support vector machines, which kind of probably should have take place before this, not because it's building on any material from that, but more sort of from a historical perspective, um, what we were sort of building on. Um, uh, but, but either way, next class is actually gonna be our final lecture from me. And then um, next week we will have uh, presentations and I will, um, I will make uh, an, uh, an announcement and also talk about it in class about um, presentation order, what should go into the presentation and, and how long um, they should be. They're actually, because we have uh, a lot more um, people this year than in previous years, the presentations themselves are, are actually gonna have to be pretty short, um, but that's okay. I would, I would definitely think of the presentations again more as um, sort of a stepping stone to your final project and not, or your final project report and not as anything sort of finalized. Um, so I do want you to have taken a look at the data, done some exploratory analysis and started to run some models and, and show some of those outputs, but it, but it doesn't have to be final. Um, and, and you should be getting feedback from me and incorporating some of that for, for the final um, project report. Um, okay, so we'll end here um, and I'll stick around um, a couple minutes if there are any other questions.